Okay, I will do it also for Professor Polgarax, okay? Yes, just have them both ready. And it's ready to start broadcasting in... It's already streaming. In a moment. We have a very good connection maybe. Okay, I will do it. Great, we're live streaming. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Palikarakis, whenever you want. Uh, do you see any participants or it's okay? 18 participants up to now, and I will start recording in five seconds, okay? okay. So, that you, so that you may start in a minute. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. And uh, I wish you a very nice week with, uh, as, with small problems. And uh, as far as we can stay at home and we can communicate is a good sign. This uh, Health Technologies Assessment of Medical Device webinar is, uh, has been organized in the framework of lectures uh, in the BME postgraduate course at the University of Patras. And in this course, uh, Aris Dermijakis is teaching the medical instrumentation subject, um, and uh, we combine it with uh, the health technology assessment and clinical engineering subject that I'm teaching. Uh, in, we were planning in the beginning of the semester to, to invite uh, various uh, high-level speakers from all over the world. And uh, Professor Leandro Pecchia was one of them, and uh, uh, Ernesto Iandanza was another one that they were willing to come and visit us in Patras and uh, give these lectures uh, real-time face-to-face. But unfortunately, as everything has changed and we are living a very strange period in our life, uh, we canceled all these uh, uh, meetings. But then uh, last week, uh, during the Health Technology Assessment Division uh, meeting, I launched a proposal saying, why don't we organize a kind of Skype uh, teleconference and uh, uh, it has been uh, a reply from uh, Leandro Pecchia and uh, Julie Polisena and Ernesto Iandanza that they are willing to participate and uh, this was great. And in just uh, three days, Caliro uh, Istavrianou, uh, who is uh, the uh, manager of the Global CE Journal and uh, also of the Secretary of uh, Clinical uh, uh, Engineering Division, uh, proposed to use uh, the uh, Zoom uh, webinar tool that is used now by the Clinical Engineering Division with a lot of success. And uh, of course, as usually, I ask uh, Tom uh, Jude, uh, the chairman of the Clinical Engineering Division, and uh, responded to my request uh, very quickly that he was going, we could use the webinar uh, tools of uh, the division and uh, also the webinar was going to be endorsed by the clinical engineering division, also the health technology assessment division, and uh, lastly by Elevit, the Hellenic Society of uh, biomedical engineering and co-organized by INBIT and here we are. And I'm uh, really very happy that uh, this uh, plan in three days uh, became a reality. And um, I'm uh, really uh, thankful to all these uh, who participated in building up this um, adventure, I could say, because the first time for me to have a webinar and uh, truly speaking, I'm uh, feeling a little bit uncomfortable. 
for the moment, knowing that uh, it is live stream, that all these new facilities that are provided today. Then Julie Polisena, I'm glad to pre-announce to you that uh, she will be present uh, here next uh, Monday and uh, together with Ernesto Yandanza, uh, they who will chair the next session, uh, they are going to present uh, health technology assessment activities uh, as uh, they are uh, now uh, are organized by the division and also, but uh, Mostly, Julie will present um, a, her um, presentation on uh, real-world data on medical device uh, life cycle, uh, which are very much uh, useful for health technology assessment. I think it will be a great event as well. Uh, if I may have the second slide uh, now. It's, um, uh, so I will, I will continue with a small introduction uh, on uh, health technology assessment of medical devices. And then I will give the floor to a very known expert in the field, Associate Professor Leandro, uh, Iad, uh, sorry, Leandro Pecchia, uh, who is going to give the main uh, contribution on this um, uh, webinar. Uh, uh, I think that most of you, you know Leandro Pecchia, is Associate Professor of the School of Engineering at the University of Warwick. Uh, he's uh, elected President of the European Alliance of Medical and Biological Engineering and Science. Uh, he is the Treasurer of the Clinical Engineering Division of IFMB. He is the Secretary General of the International Union for Physical and by an engineering science and medical uh, and medicine in medicine, IUPESM. And uh, he has a very, very, very extensive experience on uh, health technology assessment. He is, I would say, a good uh, friend. And then it will be followed by uh, question and answers. And uh, you are uh, encouraged to put um, uh, in uh, writing your uh, uh, questions and uh, we will try to uh, reply to you. Uh, if I may have the next slide, uh, there is something common between um, all the four of us that we are here. And uh, the common thing uh, is that uh, I, I think I will go, this is for INBIT, the Institute of Biomedical Technology that uh, will celebrate 30 years of existence next year. But um, this year, if I may go to the next slide, um, uh, this year what it is, um, uh, the common uh, background between all four of us that we are presenting here is this uh, biomedical engineering course that uh, celebrating today, uh, this year, the 30 years of existence. And uh, all uh, of us we were involved in, um, in this um, uh, biomedical engineering program that uh, started in 90, 1990 and uh, with the first uh, graduate from Patras University and continue for almost 30 years and uh, uh, with uh, a lot of um, important uh, I could say uh, new uh, things that have been established. It was one of the first in Europe that apply ECTS. Uh, uh, we had uh, many uh, in, uh, movement of uh, teachers and uh, students. Teachers were coming from all over Europe to teach in Patras and students as well. Uh, more than 600 students uh, follow this course uh, between um, uh, uh, in, during the last five, 25 years, and uh, Leandro and Aris and, uh, and um, Kali Roy are uh, also included in this, and I'm very proud of having such uh, colleagues today that uh, they made longer or shorter time in Patras. So uh, I'm, uh, as you understand, um, a very uh, 
uh, touched by this uh, at this moment. We were planning to, to, to organize in uh, two weeks uh, from now uh, a, an anniversary reunion, but COVID uh, didn't allow us to do this plan, and uh, we're going to have this probably in September, as we hope. So uh, I think um, um, I have to go now to the real presentation and um, give you some uh, kind of introduction on uh, uh, how health technology assessment could be uh, seen for medical devices and uh, what is um, our involvement in this. So, uh, may I have the next, please? And uh, we are uh, we're really in a, in, a, in a period where there is, as Leandro says, a tsunami of new medical devices that uh, they are appearing every day uh, in uh, our life. And uh, of course, everybody will agree that health uh, care is uh, technology driven and there are so many companies that are in this galaxy of medical devices, research institutes, independent organization, WHO, competent authority, notified body that, that are involved in this uh, and decision makers, uh, healthcare systems, uh, hospitals, and patients. And uh, next, uh, I think it is a whole universe, and uh, we have to deal with uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, devices available on the market. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, if we consider next uh, uh, that uh, health technology, it is a uh, composed by drugs, vaccines, medical devices, uh, the medical and surgical procedures, support system, etc. And uh, uh, today we have uh, medical devices in the front end uh, of um, uh, this, all these health technologies that are related with uh, the uh, fight against the coronavirus. Because neither drugs or uh, vaccines are not yet available and uh, uh, only medical devices starting from simple masks and uh, protective uh, personal protective equipment and, uh, uh, and going to, to uh, ventilators and intensive care units. Uh, the most important, let's say, uh, health technology today is uh, in the hands of doctors is uh, our medical devices. And uh, health technology assessment is uh, one of the pillars of uh, uh, in the whole life cycle of medical devices that assures uh, that uh, safe equipment are continued to, to use. And it is a multidisciplinary field of uh, policy analysis that examine medical, economic, social, and ethical implication of the technology. Uh, next. Uh, if, uh, as I said, uh, we look uh, uh, to the three pillars, uh, we have the regulation, the management, and the assessment. And the regulation uh, looks to uh, safety issues uh, before the medical devices are uh, coming to the market. Uh, so that uh, when the medical device is on the market, it is uh, safe and effective for the users. However, and we have, of course, regulations and uh, directives, etc. However, in, in order to maintain uh, the efficiency and uh, the performance of medical devices, uh, we need during the use to have a good management of this technology. And uh, we need to have uh, management systems in the hospital that they will assure that uh, everything will be maintained the right way in order to be kept in good conditions and uh, uh, be safe during the use for the patients. At the end, it comes to the health technology assessment that looks to the different technologies from clinical effectiveness point of view, but also taking into consideration ethics, uh, social issues, and 
organization issues. And uh, next, uh, health technology assessment for medical devices comes at the end of the life cycle of medical devices. goes to regulation, clinical trials and regulation uh, to, to, to get uh, to, to the final products on the market that it is used by the hospitals, by the medical doctors, uh, and the management is uh, provided by the clinical engineering department and uh, in, in the hostel environment. And uh, then it comes uh, when there is enough evidence to, to see if this technology is uh, really providing what is promising. A health technology assessment comes and that plays a good, um, a very big role on the reimbursement of different um, uh, technologies. Next. Uh, with uh, this occasion, I think that uh, I had to say that uh, during uh, the management of technology, we have to, to think about that in the front line today in the hospitals fighting the coronavirus uh, um, pandemic are the clinical engineers that are assuring the uh, maintenance of the devices in order to be able to provide this. And sometimes this is uh, something that uh, it is forgotten. Now, health technology assessment as a tool provides information and evidence on comparative clinical effectiveness and uh, comparative cost effectiveness. So the cost is coming as a very important factor, but also to have deliver uh, organizational aspects are examined, uh, legal framework, is taken into account an ethical and social implication. Next. And uh, it is very important that, uh, a, that the analysis of HTA goes to different domains uh, in relation with uh, the technology. Uh, and it is not only the health uh, problem that it is addressed by the technology uh, and the technical characteristics, safety and clinical effectiveness uh, issues, but also goes to economic, ethical, as I said, and uh, other aspects. And uh, uh, that makes a big difference when and where we can apply the same type of uh, health technology assessment results in different environments, in different countries, in different uh, continents or uh, different hospitals. In general, we can say that we have uh, some basic type of HTA, and I will uh, leave Leandro to, to, to more elaborate on that. But uh, we say that we have uh, uh, the full health technology uh, assessment reports that they cover all these various domains. And we have the relative effectiveness assessment who covers only the technical part and the clinical effectiveness and not the economic and all the other sessions. So now there are, of course, the hospital-based health, health technology assessment, uh, smaller reports and horizon scanning tools, et cetera, that uh, uh, it is not in uh, my uh, intention to, to give some more information on that today. Next. So I think that uh, this uh, is, uh, I, I will move a little bit on what happened in Europe, as far as I know. Uh, they recognize the, the significance of uh, HCA has been recognized quite uh, early. And uh, in the beginning, in the middle, rather, of uh, the year 2000, we had some uh, activities and uh, uh, that uh, have been uh, pilot studies and uh, projects in the European Union, and I will a little bit uh, go further to one of them next, which is related to uh, the UNETA. Even before UNETA, of course, we had uh, in many European countries uh, well established uh, HDA agencies over the last 20 years and more, and uh, in most of the Central and uh, North uh, European countries, and uh, some of them are appearing here in this uh, slide. Next, please. Uh, so, the 
EU NESA project uh, started in the uh, year 2006 um, to 2008 and then continued with a bridge uh, uh, project. Uh, followed by three joint actions by the uh, Commission for the years uh, 10 to 12, 12 to 15, and uh, uh, 16 to 20, and now these uh, joint actions uh, of the European Union uh, that uh, were well um, uh, financed by the European Union are finishing. Uh, the objective of this action was to reduce the overlap and duplication of efforts uh, in health technology assessment to increase the health technology assessment in decision making to strengthen the links between the different bodies and to support countries uh, with uh, limited uh, HD experience to go on. Next, please. Uh, I will uh, skip uh, this. I think here are some uh, results of uh, joint uh, actions and full reports and uh, uh, outputs that uh, they came out of this. Next. I, uh, UNETA is, is a very active um, um, organization and um, uh, there have, I, I suggest you to go through the website. We are glad that uh, we have representatives in the board. Uh, George Kaluchos from uh, Onassis Cardiac Hospital in Greece is in the board of the, this organization. And many organizations in Greece are in, included in the UNETA network. Next. Uh, however, in Greece, I should say from now that uh, we have not uh, a real HDA agency. Uh, given uh, the success of UNETA, the European Commission wanted to have something more uh, regulated as a structure and created the EU HDA network, uh, which is more a kind of uh, network of um, regulatory uh, authorities that they are uh, taking part of this and uh, the, is, they create a kind of strategy for EU collaboration of health technology assessment. How, however, I could say that uh, the, there is a quite strict participation in accessibility rules next. And that's why we have not uh, too many uh, representatives, uh, for instance, from the point of view of um, uh, stakeholders, that network that is associated to this, uh, only two uh, uh, European um, uh, manufacturers associations are included in the stakeholders. Uh, there is no biomedical engineer in society, European. Uh, uh, organization that it is included and uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, uh, we should take into account. Uh, of course, uh, Leandro Pekia could uh, uh, give you the initiatives of Ambers that he succeeded to go and to create a European Parliament interest group on biomedical engineering. This was a really very big success. But uh, uh, really yet we have not a representation in this uh, stakeholders uh, list. Next. Now, uh, what are the challenges uh, for the health technology assessment uh, during the next few years? Uh, first of all, there is an insufficient uptake of the joint HTA by member states. Uh, there are differences in organization, operation, administration, etc. There are differences among national uh, HTA methodologies. And uh, in general, uh, the, it is not sure that the current model of uh, HTA it will be sustainable. Uh, it should be some, uh, th there are some, some uh, kind of uh, thoughts of uh, how the, some issues will be regulated. 
uh, the European Commission probably they wanted to have uh, more regulation on, on that. So there is a discussion on the European Parliament and the Council. Uh, uh, what should be the, how the they are going to have some cases that they will be mandatory or will be uh, on a voluntary basis. Uh, they will focus on uh, technical aspects, etc. Next, and uh, uh, there are of course some um, uh, other challenges. For instance, uh, uh, challenges that are related to uh, balancing access and quality of care and sustainability of the healthcare system. For instance, acceptable, uh, to my opinion, acceptable levels of safety, cost effectiveness may vary in different countries or different circumstances and environments. Uh, uh, population health benefits should be weighted and um, uh, we should answer the questions, are the intervention cost effective? Uh, is the technology affordable or is in context specific? Uh, can we use the same type of results uh, for different environments, different countries, etc.? Next. Uh, sometimes uh, health technology reports are uh, also coming uh, at, uh, uh, at not the right time because there is a problem when to assess. Uh, uh, we should make a health technology assessment when we have enough evidence gathered uh, in order to study most of the parameters. As, however, this is a moving target and sometimes when the assessment comes in, the technology has already uh, gone. Uh, next. And uh, I could say that uh, uh, we have to look also, and I think Leandro will go into more details on that, on the differences of the approaches that are used for health technology assessment for drugs and the approaches that should be used for medical devices. It is now recognized, but it was not the case when we started about 10 years ago to, to see how this was happening in the, in the worldwide, I think. And uh, uh, now the new regulatory framework in the European Union is taking care of that. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the influence of med medical technology trends also should be taken into account in the future because we are going to face new technologies of medical devices that are coming into the scene. And uh, uh, these technologies are quite different from the existing ones. Uh, all the parameters that should be taken into account uh, when you, we uh, assess uh, medical devices compared to drugs are related to, uh, to the fact that medical devices are not uh, used the same time, the, the, the same, uh, uh, in the same way, uh, are de very much dependent on the experience of the users, are very much dependent on the environment, and so the results that are coming out of the health technology assessment use of medical devices and uh, are, are quite different and should be approached by a different uh, uh, way. Next. Uh, there are some uh, regional initiatives, mainly for uh, drugs, uh, that some countries, they have been uh, linked together to, to negotiate um, with uh, pharmaceutical companies prices next of medical devices and we have three groups for the moment and for instance the Valletta initiative where Greece is also involved uh, has uh, mainly countries from the Mediterranean area and uh, looks to uh, uh, in, a, in a certain way to, to deal with uh, manufacturers concerning uh, prices of uh, drugs for a, quite a big uh, part of the European uh, population. Next. 
In uh, Greece, uh, the existing background and experience in technology assessment is uh, rather limited. Uh, we uh, have um, mainly, the uh, committees are mainly focusing on uh, technology assessment reports. Uh, there is no agency yet um, uh, established. Uh, we must use HTA reports, but we have to learn how to fit them into the Greek uh, context. And uh, we have also to uh, enhance uh, the role of health technology, uh, hospital-based health technology assessment. Next. Uh, there is a, a new agency that should be established in Greece, uh, and this is uh, something that it is uh, an obligation um, uh, that, uh, however, last a few years now, and uh, we, it is not yet a reality. Uh, there was a draft law, but finally was not uh, put in public um, uh, discussion. Uh, we have, in any case, uh, when we are going to create this new agency, to really consider very carefully the needs and what should be the priorities of such an agency in the Greek uh, context. Next. And um, uh, we have uh, a collaboration uh, in, as uh, Institute of Biomedical Technology in uh, this area with WHO. WHO has uh, an office in uh, Athens and uh, uh, during the period uh, between uh, 2016 and 2019, we had a very close collaboration with the WHO office in Athens and uh, who was uh, uh, head by Silvio Domente. And uh, during this period, we had uh, three reports on health technology assessment in Greece uh, that we participated. The first one in 16, that was a general report on the health technology assessment situation in Greece uh, by two experts uh, that uh, came from uh, the headquarters of uh, uh, the WHO in uh, Denmark. Uh, then we had uh, a second one, a second report uh, on developing the medical device component in this type of um, the health technology assessment system in Greece. And uh, uh, during these uh, uh, meetings of this report, Adriana Velasquez, this uh, extraordinary person in WHO who is uh, really motivating hundreds of experts all over the world. It's a, it's a, it's a person that should admit that I admire. And uh, she came with Oriana Gianni from uh, Italy, from Bocconi University, and we had a very good meeting and we prepared a, a, a report for the Greek Ministry of uh, Health. And finally, we came up with a health technology assessment seminar and workshop uh, uh, last year in March, and I had the pleasure to have again Oriana Gianni and Leandro Pecchia as uh, teachers together with George Halusos from Onassis uh, uh, Hospital. And uh, it was a very successful event, and I hope that some of the, of the persons that they follow this uh, seminar, they are also uh, following this uh, webinar today. Uh, then we had a rather confidential quick note on the draft law at that moment and at the end of, um, at the beginning of uh, 2019. And uh, we also participated in some uh, other uh, studies that are HTA related, uh, reviewing specification for hip and knee prosthesis as uh, indeed. Inbid, with these occasions, uh, established a library in his uh, uh, site uh, with uh, reports on medical devices that we collected from um, uh, the, uh, almost uh, 20 years. Uh, and it is in our site, and we are going to extend it uh, next. 
in the near future. And uh, uh, I think that uh, you can also invite it to, uh, to, to visit the InBitWets uh, website, where, of course, uh, there is uh, also a, a kind of uh, part of this site that uh, speaks about uh, COVID-19 uh, and uh, it is uh, also announced this webinar in our site. Next, please. Uh, closing this uh, presentation, I should say that uh, there is a need for education. Uh, biomedical engineers should uh, learn uh, uh, how to use and how to be involved in uh, health technology assessment uh, reports uh, uh, and uh, studies. Uh, the, but mostly the uh, managers of the hospital should be aware of uh, the benefits that health technology assessment could provide to them when they are taking decisions. So I think that we should stress uh, this uh, uh, need for education, both in uh, the educational programs of uh, biomedical engineering, but also to uh, provide this type of courses also into uh, clinical uh, doctors and managers also of uh, uh, hospitals in order to be able to promote this very useful uh, branch of uh, uh, and pillar of health technology. Next, please. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for listening to me. Um, sorry if I made some uh, uh, mistakes. Uh, I, I, I would like finally to thank again Kali Roy for uh, her uh, very precious support uh, to this. Uh, um, webinar experience. And now I will um, give the floor to Leandro Pekia. It's uh, really, Leandro, a very, very big uh, moment for me to, to introduce you here. Uh, you are a person that uh, you are already very well known uh, everywhere in the globe. And uh, I would just uh, introducing you, I would just uh, like to say that when uh, uh, I was uh, assigned by FMB uh, to, to revitalize or whatever, recreate the Health Technology Assessment Division in year 2011, and we started the first uh, new uh, period of the Health Technology Assessment um, Division in the year 2012 uh, by the election of the uh, next board. Uh, we did some efforts together and uh, Leandro was uh, uh, really supportive uh, in all this uh, period on how we were going to, uh, to reach uh, the right um, persons, etc. Uh, and I think we, we succeeded to, to make um, uh, our uh, presence known. But uh, when in uh, 2015, uh, Leandro Pekia took over the chair of uh, the division, then uh, in uh, really speaking, I could imagine what explosion was going to be. Uh, Leandro succeeded to, 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 to mobilize uh, uh, hundreds of people around the globe uh, to, to, to create new actions, to, to, to uh, start activities that I could not imagine uh, that could happen. And uh, then this uh, really, it was a, a kind of uh, revolution in, in the division. And it went together with a, a similar expansion of the activities of the, health technology, of the clinical engineering division. And uh, it's amazing what is happening today with uh, those two divisions of IFMB and the presence of Adriana Velasquez in WHO. We, we really uh, are living in, in a new environment today. Uh, globally, the clinical engineers and the professionals of health technology assessment are uh, working together. They know each other and uh, we, we have uh, something 
unbelievable. Uh, Ernesto, uh, who took over in 2018, is continuing this very active uh, uh, road that uh, was opened by Leandro. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, now uh, the, the phase that we really in a new era. So, Leandro, uh, I think now the floor is yours. And uh, thank you very much again for accepting to be with us today. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you for this invitation and for those kind uh, words. Yeah, so, you know that. Uh, what you just mentioned would have been never possible if you had not prepared the way for this to happen. Uh, both mm, training me when I was in this master in Greece <laughs> and uh, beyond the, the, the contents, but uh, uh, you know, passing also this passion towards this, which we perceive as a, as a civil service, as, as you have done for all your life. Uh, and uh, and Nimbit is, uh, is uh, the tangible result we've achieved in Greece and that, because I think this is an important message that uh, uh, you have taught me to teach to our editions. You know, it's beyond the technical knowledge, but it's the passion that we put in the fix. And, and you know, step by step, lao lao, uh, those things then in the end eventually succeed. Um, yeah, I would go directly to the slides, if you agree. And uh, as per your suggestion, let me see if I can share my screen. Yep. Can you just confirm that you see the screen? Good. So, um, I will. I, I thought I could have done this in uh, in this way. I will give about thirty minutes presentation about uh, what do I think it is health technology assessment and uh, what we see around Europe, at least Europe, uh, in terms of appraisal. So, what are the methods and tools that a biomedical engineer should consider when you'd like to see your medical device entering the real world? And then I will dedicate the last uh, 10 minutes to presenting what it is the perspective of the uh, health technology assessment from the IFMB, the International Federation of Biomedical Engineering, with a particular focus on medical devices, as Nicola already mentioned. So uh, you have been already probably introduced to those concepts, but uh, in case you have not, let me just start recalling what do we mean by health technology, uh, because otherwise also the reference to medical devices is not fully clear. By health technology, we mean basically any form of organized knowledge which is intended to have an impact on the health of patients. And uh, therefore, this concept goes beyond the devices, beyond the equipment. It includes any sort of organized knowledge, which means also procedures, also drugs, also the organization of a novel service which is intended to achieve a better impact on the health of patient. This is absolutely intended by healthcare technology. So health technology, it's a very broad concept. Therefore, health technology assessment is intended as a systematic uh, uh, method and tool aiming at assessing the impact of an healthcare technology. By its nature, it must be multidisciplinary because uh, health technology now we mentioned it span from drugs to very advanced medical devices to clinical procedures. So the domain expert will have to change according to what you are going to assess. But then there are some further underlying uh, um, domains which are relevant for an health technology assessment. Certainly the economic domain, certainly the regulatory framework, certainly the ethical domain. So there are domains which are cross-cutting any sort of assessment you want to do, regardless of the specific technology you are intended to assess. And uh, as I mentioned before, in the last 10 minutes, I will give you my opinion about why, in my opinion, any biomedical engineer should be trained on this particular topic. Um, as well as, and we can start from here, Nowadays, according to the World Health Organization, the assessment of a medical device is uh, somehow a barrier to the introduction, is perceived as a barrier to the introduction of medical devices, 
And that's often because uh, health technology assessment is uh, considered a bit too late. When a novel technology is going to enter the real world, that's when many people start thinking about the health technology assessment, especially for medical devices. And actually, this is a little bit too late, as we will see later. But before we start, why do we need health technology assessment? And uh, before we continue, let me remind to all the attendees that uh, below in your Zoom window, you have a question and answer section, which you can see as two small clouds as a comics. Please use this tool to ask any question. And in the end, with the help of the moderators, we will try to answer those questions as much as we can. So please use the question and answer box below to ask any question. But now, before we start, why do we need an L technology assessment? Well, we need an L technology assessment for several reasons. First of all, because in any healthcare system, the budget is limited. And in some cases, even scarce. Now, if the budget is limited, it means that you have a pot of money through which you aim at uh, um, satisfying a series of needs spanning across different kinds of patients, different kinds of problems. And this means, in other words, that uh, if you spend one euro to solve one problem, this automatically means that you are taking off this euro from something else. So if you are investing in pediatric medicine, it means that you are disinvesting from geriatric medicine. And that's because your pot of money is limited. So every time you want to introduce a novel medical device, you need to ask yourself, where, where is the NHS taking those money off? Because the budget is limited. We, we cannot imagine increasing a limited increase of budget for health care. This is not realistic. The other problem why you need the very uh, structured and uh, clear and transparent method is, the, is because value in health, it's very difficult to assess. How much would you value your health? This is not an easy question to answer. You can value the, 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 everything in, in, that you use in everyday life, a table, a car, uh, whatever, even the art. But when it comes to health, this is much more difficult also because we tend as human beings not to really value health until we are not in need of health. So even if you manage to value your health now, if any of the circumstances change, then your attribution of value to health would dramatically change with it. So it's not easy to find a generally accepted concept of value for health, but indeed we have to do that. And how much we value, uh, how much do we value our health in case of disease, as I was saying before. And the other important thing is that is not a transferable value. You cannot pass your health to someone else. You cannot sell your youth. And uh, because of that, you cannot delegate the attribution of economic value to health to the market. No, you know that one of the fundamental rules of the market is that the, the, the balance between the demand and the offer will create the price. So the more is the demand, the more I can increase the price of uh, a good or a service. And the less is the demand, the lower will be the, the, the value of the same service or, 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 or um, object that I'm trying to sell. The fundamental of this principle is the fact that you can take this service and sell to someone else. So I can transfer this good after I buy a car, then I can sell this car to someone else. We dealt this fundamental principle, which is one of the pillar of the uh, free market, basically doesn't work. You cannot give your youth to someone else. Okay, you can donate a, an organ. Yeah, probably this is doable, but uh, otherwise you cannot really donate your health to someone else. It's not a, an easy way there is not an easy way to transfer. And in the end, there is another huge problem, which is an information asymmetry. So when you buy any other sort of uh, good or, or, or service, probably you have a better understanding of uh, what you are buying, what are the different options. You may buy a car and now you can think if you wanna buy a diesel or a fuel or a whatever else kind of car, or you wanna move from point A to point B, you can choose a train, bus, car, airplane, or whatever, and you eventually may understand the implication. But when it comes to health, it's very difficult because the medical doctor, they have all the knowledge, but 
the one regarding advanced technologies. I mean, very few medical doctors have the same understanding of uh, uh, technology as a biomedical engineer can do. Um, a patient normally, they do not have the same knowledge as the medical doctor. And uh, further complication in the majority of European system is that, well, it, it, in reality all over the globe, is that the one which is getting a service is not the one which is directly paying for the service. But if you are in Europe, this is done through taxes. If you are in the States or uh, in, uh, in the majority of the other American countries, then obviously this is coming from uh, insurance. But it's very rare that in health we have someone which is buying and paying for the services buying. So uh, those differences make very difficult the assessment of value in healthcare and the pricing, the appraisal of a novel technology in healthcare. So we need to understand where this is coming from, how this normally affect traditional markets in order to understand what do we have to do which is different in healthcare. Because if we don't start from there, people just ask us, why do we need an health technology assessment? Those are some of the reasons, but obviously only these would deserve an entire lecture and a couple of hours of reflection. We don't have this time today. We are among engineers, so I can be very fast in uh, introducing a couple of fundamental definitions, which then will be very useful to go over the remaining part of this lecture. We can see an hospital, an health care service provider as, a, as a, a transformative process, as a black box in which we input whatever input we need from budget to knowledge to people doing this job and we'll generate an output. This output is now, for instance, the number of beds you can dedicate to COVID or for instance, the number of visits you can do in one day or the number of surgeries that you can deliver in a week or two. And this is normally called Output. So if we were a coil uh, energy production farm, then the input would have been coil workers and whatever else, and the output would have been kilowatt. But because we are, let's say, an hospital, the input is whatever I put it on this slide, but the output can be any sort of service that normally an hospital is offering to patients. But indeed, if we are doing an assessment in healthcare, this is not really what we are looking for. What we are looking for is the next box, which is the impact of those output on the health of people living in my region. And therefore, my ultimate goal with the healthcare technology is to improve or maintain the health. Improve if I want to, you know, treat a surgery or uh, treat an injury or maintain if I'm now fi uh, fighting a chronic disease, which uh, we know some of those cannot be completely healed, but uh, we need to slow down the deterioration coming from this chronic condition, let's say diabetes. That's really what I wanna do. I don't care how many visits per day you can do if then you are not having a good impact on the healthcare of people living in your region. That's my ultimate goal. And I need to take into account when I think to the assessment of a novel medical device, that there are factors which no matter how much I want to do, but uh, they will every time affect and normally diminishing the outcome of my action. And those are environmental conditions and people behaviors. Uh, you know, if uh, my hospital is in a place where people keep smoking, for instance, then obviously they come to the hospital which much deteriorated health than if the hospital was somewhere else. And this underlying condition, this behavior, is having a strong impact on my capability to heal their chronic condition. Let's image COPD, chronic obstructive uh, pulmonary disease. And, uh, and obviously, having to treat a smoker or non-smoker make a huge difference. So there are, every time, behavioral and environmental conditions, which are for us as engineers, external factors, which means we do not fully control, and they have an impact on the outcome. Now, if you accept those definitions, then I can easily move into the fundamental parameters that we use in an health technology assessment. First of all, I can define the efficiency, where actually an hospital is more efficient than another hospital if with the same input, they produce more output. So this hospital with the 10 euro produced 10 beds. The other hospital with 10 euro produced 20 beds. The other hospital is more efficient. 
And that's a typical concept in engineering. Now the Carnot cycle is a, is a matter of efficiency. You have a pump, you use energy to produce something. The ratio between the thing that you are producing divided by the energy you are using, this means that your system, is your pump is more efficient than anything else. But what we are really interested to see in healthcare is actually the efficacy, which is the ratio of the outcome on the output, which means that with one bet, one hospital probably can treat uh, better than another. So for, with uh, one bed, I can save three life, while another hospital with three bed can save one life. So clearly in healthcare, we look after the outcome. And this is the for introducing another complication because whatever else, probably the output would have been enough. But now I need to focus on the outcome and I need to measure the impact that my hospital is having in terms of outcome and not just output. And then obviously I may like to consider both, which is the performance, in which case I want to focus on the ratio of the outcome on the input, which means I want to know how much I had to invest in order to save one life, which is the ultimate goal of the majority of health technology assessment. When I think to an health technology assessment, I have a clear model in my mind. First of all, I need to understand what are the needs which uh, a novel technology is eventually aiming at uh, satisfying. Those will normally be clinical needs, but there will be many other needs. I mean, I can improve uh, the organization of an hospital. I can improve the uh, communication with a patient, which uh, is often an important variable. So the first thing I do, I need to identify all the different needs, then probably cluster them in relevant categories, and then eventually try to prioritize, because it's very unlikely that the novel technology would be better than another in all those needs, but probably a novel technology is better than a benchmark in satisfying the most important needs. That's a, a much more realistic situation. So once I have done this need analysis, that's what I mean, identify, classify, and prioritize the needs which my technology needs to satisfy, then I eventually start considering the existing technologies and try to understand if the novel one is more or less competitive against the benchmark or the other ones existing on the market. And now, when I do that, as I mentioned before, I need to have in mind several domains. Economical domain, I want to be cheaper than the benchmark or at least have the same cost as much as possible if I am having a better impact. But we'll go into that in a while. Then I may have to consider other conditions like the ethical or social domain. And certainly I need to consider a clinical or epidemiological domain. There can be many more. I mean, there can be the technical domain. There can be several domains that you need to take into account for a specific technology. And those normally change according to the specific technology you are trying to assess. Once you've done that, you have to put those numbers together. And that's never easy because now we are saying that we want to sum tomatoes with potatoes with something else. So you need methods which allow you to put together things which are by their nature deeply different. So the scale which you can use to measure economical domain are different than the one you may use for measuring the clinical impact. And clearly just talking about scale into the ethical domain, it's by itself complicated. And once you've done this analysis, now you want to go back and see if after this analysis, some of the technology you were considering, probably they now are not anymore relevant, or if you miss it something by doing this analysis, you may end up and uh, you identify something which you not considered before and uh, is, uh, sorry, we are in lockdown and it's happening, whatever can happen. So you close this loop several times and uh, in the end, you want to assess the relative value of the measures that I mentioned before, which can be efficacy, efficiency, or performance. And once you've done that, and I will focus on that for the remaining 20 minutes, you then need to disseminate your information. Why do we need to disseminate? Because normally, the ones in charge of the health technology assessment are not those taking the final decision, but through your assessment, you are informing a decision which a decision maker may choose to take for a reason or another. So the one running the assessment is normally not the same person which is taking the decision. But uh, this is a technical team informing a policy maker. And the last but not the least step is that you need to keep monitoring the result of your assessment because what can be not cost-effective today can become cost-effective tomorrow because, for instance, 
the cost of an innovative technology uh, tends to get down over time due to mass scale production. Now, we will focus mainly on this, the relative assessment of efficacy, efficiency, and if at all possible, performance. And uh, when we study a novel technology, what do we do? We compare this novel technology with whatever it is already on the market, a possible benchmark. And indeed, we have only four possibilities. So if my technology is better than the benchmark, and it's also cheaper, so assuming your benchmark is in the center, so in this part of the diagram, it means that you are doing better for less, which means that your technology is uh, doing absolutely better than the benchmark, and therefore um, you have a green light. So your technology will be adopted. The opposite of that is when you are here, which means that uh, your technology is doing not better, even worse than whatever is already on the market, and your cost is higher, in which case your technology would be certainly rejected and the one which is in use will keep being used. And that's obviously not a common case because if you are doing an assessment, it means that at least you would expect that your technology is performing better than whatever benchmark. If you are taking this discussion within an hospital because you are the clinical engineer in charge of the selection, because in hospital normally we focus on selection rather than assessment, uh, it means that you are assuming that the novel technology you want to convince your hospital to buy is performing better than whatever you already in any of the dimension we mentioned before. The most common situation is this one, when you are facing a technology which is better, but uh, is also more expensive than the benchmark. This is a common situation because for the reason I mentioned before, if you are running an assessment, it means that you start from the idea that whatever you do is better, so it's here, uh, and normally novel technologies, they come with higher cost. So most likely we will be in this part of this diagram. There is a fourth area, which is this one in which I use something which is, uh, I know it's worse, but uh, the cost is lower. This is not normally a domain in which we work with innovative technology. I've never seen anyone saying, look, use my technology because I know it's not better, but it's cheaper. This is eventually a domain which you explore when you are working at limited resources. So you know that the most innovative technology would eventually absorb all the national budget for healthcare. So it's not possible to invest in that. And then you scale down and you go looking for the next available solution, which has a reasonable cost, which is affordable for the budget you have. So in normal situation, when we work on innovative technology, we normally don't focus on this domain, but there can be cases in which. But uh, today, I will focus mainly in this region. And what do you do in this region? Well, what you do is that you normally have a threshold, which is the so-called willingness to pay. And uh, this is exactly the amount that uh, your society is willing to spend for an incremental uh, improvement of health. Now, in some uh, states, in some nations in Europe, there is a very straightforward dynamic. So there is a very well-known threshold for the willingness to pay. And if you are within this amount, then you are almost automatically admitted into the public service. So the NHS will give public money to pay for your innovation. In other member states, the situation is slightly different, but this is often a starting point for a negotiation with the Ministry of Health. What do we mean by willingness to pay and how we relate our technology, the performance of our technology with this willingness to pay. Well, you can draw a line in this uh, upper right part of the diagram, which is called the cost effectiveness diagram. And basically, once you draw this line, you have a few options. You can be here, as we said before, you are doing better for less. So this is a no brain issue. But most often you will be here because your technology is doing better, is more effective than the benchmark. And remember, the benchmark is assumed to be uh, in the center of this diagram. But you are also increasing the quality of life, for instance. Sorry, this is the increasement of the quality of life, for instance. So you are increasing the efficacy. You are having a better impact than the benchmark, but you are also more expensive. Now, given this incremental improve of quality of life, there is a threshold 
which the society is willingness to pay is willing to pay to achieve this marginal this net increment of the quality of life and if you are below this threshold which means below this line then you are below the so called willingness to pay and most likely your negotiation with the nhs if all the other variables are okay will be successful if you are in the uk this is almost automatic if you are in other countries this is the base for negotiation with the nhs Obviously, you can be in a situation like that, in which it's clear that your technology is doing better than the benchmark. You are incrementing, I don't know, mortality, reducing mortality of 10%, which is fine. But the cost for this is not sustainable. And this brings us back to our premises. So when we introduce a novel technology, we need to consider that the overall budget is limited. So if your technology is providing a, an incremental, a net value, in, uh, in uh, one domain doesn't mean that this is automatically admitted due to the NHS because I need to look at the global picture. I need to consider the benefit for all the population. So it could be that an increment of few percentage of mortality in this particular disease is not well balanced by the fact that you will have to take off those money from something else. And so obviously there are several reasonings through which you are right to the conclusion that if that's your incremental value this is the maximum net cost that the society is willing to spend if you spend that much i know you are doing better but not enough to justify this kind of investment if you want me to justify this kind of investment you have to do exactly this increment better than your Berger mark and that's the way we use willingness to pay clearly when you run an assessment you don't really have all the information you wish to have. I mean, it's often the result of a projection, it's also the result of uh, a small study that you have, well, small or big, but it's a study that you have done in a sub part of your final population. And so what happened is that uh, you have some uncertainty and often this uncertainty is crossing this threshold. So those are typically the questions that a biomedical engineer has to solve at the end of uh, an early stage health technology assessment, which I will not mention today. And so probably here the answer is, OK, if this is your result, you need definitely to reduce the cost of your technology. And uh, if you are in an uncertainty like that, so you are here and you wish to cross the line, probably you have to go in this direction. And there are several techniques such as start from this group of patients for which this kind of benefit is more important than in other patients. Let's say mobility. If you have a technology which is uh, uh, allowing the patient to gain complete mobility or increase mobility of 20%, whatever it means, probably this is more um, useful and more beneficial in a pediatric population than it can be in a geriatric population. So to some extent, you can focus on a target population for which the same benefit has more value than in another circumstance. Now, when we do assessment, we face all sorts of different possible scenario. And uh, again, this is another concept that would need probably an entire module or an entire lecture to fully appreciate it. This is coming from the Drummond, one of the pillars of health uh, economic evaluation or just economic evaluation, not only in healthcare, but in the public sector. And uh, basically what we learned is that uh, when we read the study, for instance, a paper, we need to ask ourselves what was under assessment. Were they considering cost and consequences? If they were, then you should ask yourself, are they considering more than one alternative? I don't know, the novel one versus the benchmark. If it is the case, you are doing what we call a complete economic evaluation. But then there are all other sort of partial assessment. For instance, you may have a study which is considering cost and consequences, but only for one technology, which means it does not allow you to take a decision benchmarking with whatever is the benchmark. Or you may have a so-called partial evaluation, which is focusing only on the cost or only on the consequences. For instance, this is the typical clinical study in which you describe one novel technology and the benefit this technology is having on a series of patients. I'm just describing the clinical benefit, no mention to the cost. Or for instance, I may have those kind of partial assessment in which I'm considering more than one alternative, but still I'm moving only into the clinical domain. And here you find all the meta-analysis, randomized control trial, observational study, epidemiological study, they lie down there. And learning how to put into the context of uh, uh, evidence generation in medicine anything 
within health technology assessment, but in my opinion, also into the design of a medical device is crucial for a successful biomedical engineer. So long story short, what I'm saying now is assuming that we are in this domain, that we are doing a complete analysis, we are considering costs and consequences, and we are benchmarking our technology with something else, which means a novel, um, an innovation versus a benchmark. Now, if I am in this domain, I can use four different approaches. The first one is the so-called cost minimization, cost minimization, which is mainly academic. I've never seen those analyses really done unless I want to start from there to do what is coming next. In this kind of analysis, I measure the input. You remember my diagram uh, with the monetary unit. So it can be euro, pound, uh, yuan, wen, whatever monetary unit you like to consider, dollars. But the consequence is only one in one domain, and you are assuming that the technology you are assessing with respect to the benchmark, they are achieving the same level of result in terms of improving the quality of life. If that's your case, then you just focus on the cost. And what it is the outcome that you are measuring is that uh, you are looking for the technology which is absorbing less resources. So you are looking on delta C, where C uh, stays for the cost, and you are trying to minimize this cost for the NHS, for instance. Clearly, the, the pro of this analysis is that it results in a uni univocal result. This is cheaper than that, no possible interpretation. And uh, this is important because it's the first step for any of the analysis that I will mention in a second. But clearly, the limit is that uh, doesn't doesn't really measure the impact, so the efficient, the, the, the efficacy of a medical device. To do that, I need to move forward, and I may like to consider a cost-effectiveness analysis, in which, again, the input can be measured in terms of monetary unit. The consequences, I can use one result, one measure of health, for instance, pain or just mobility or just mortality, for instance. And uh, I'm trying, I'm starting from the assumption that one technology performs better than another in terms of the increasing mortality. Let's make an exemplar. In this case, I can, I'm assuming I can measure the outcome in physical units. I don't know, age gained, pain, mobility, mortality. And uh, I will introduce in a while the final way I use to measure the result of a cost-effective analysis, which is an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio. Clearly, the pro of this analysis is that I can measure two technologies achieving different level of benefit. Uh, clearly, the, the limit is that uh, I can use this analysis for measuring heterogeneous effects. For instance, if one technology is doing better for pain, but uh, not better for mobility, and then I have another technology which is doing better for uh, mobility, but not for pain, then I can, you know, cannot really use a cost effectiveness analysis for comparing those two uh, different technologies because there is more than that. And I need more than just one uh, physical unit scale to measure the benefit of my innovative technology. The other problem is that we use in literature this distinction. We distinguish between efficacy and effectiveness, where efficacy is the benefit on the health you're measuring during a trial. The effectiveness is uh, the benefit that this technology will eventually have in real life. And normally, this is uh, lower than the one you are getting into the trial for several reasons. The equipe which is doing the trial probably is the best possible. Uh, the patients know they are involved in a trial, so they be a better. The clinicians, they know they are involved in a trial, they will be assessed, so probably they will pay more attention than usually. So there are several reasons why the efficacy is considered to be slightly higher than the effectiveness, which is the efficacy in real life. And last but not least, as we'll see in a second, there is not a universal scale to measure the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which means that the willingness to pay threshold is not universal. So the value that we consider to be accepted in the UK may be different than the value that you may consider to be acceptable in Greece. So there is no universal willingness to pay. Therefore, there is no universal scale to measure the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So once you arrive there, you need to put this into the context 
and take a decision. Now, what I need to do if I have more than one result, which I want to take into account, so mobility and pain, as I was saying before, I have to introduce a utility function. So I will talk about cost utility. And by utility function, I mean a mathematical function which allows me to put together more than one health measure. I mentioned it, pain and mobility. Those are two typical measures of health. Uh, the most common scale for utility in Europe is the quality of life. And the Euro quality is uh, a commonly used in general purpose scale for quality of life, which use five dimension. We use the Euro qual 5D, where 5D stands for five dimension. And normally those five dimensions are exactly pain, uh, mobility, comfort or discomfort, um, independency, and, uh, and the level of confidence or, or depression that uh, a patient is, uh, is uh, experiencing. So this is a general proposed scale. And the reason why this is a general proposed scale is exactly the one I mentioned in the first slide. So we are trying to assess the benefit of novel technology, not just in this group of patients, but as a, as, a, as a benefit for the whole population. So I need a scale which can be used both for pediatric and geriatric populations. So if a scale is too specific for the disease, it will never be possible to transfer the same scale to other healthcare problems. So I need to have a scale which is a, a, a general purpose. So quality of life is meant for that. Um, what are the pros that I can measure more than one health measure? I mentioned it five before. Uh, I'm assuming I can use this when I am assuming that one technology is better than the other. So you can measure to some extent some heterogeneity, but uh, this can only work in clinical domain, which normally is enough. And uh, again, there are not universal scale to measure the uh, willingness to pay in terms of cost per utility gained. Now, the only one which overcome this analysis is the so-called cost benefit. The difference between the cost benefit and cost utility analysis can be summarized as once you arrive to the quality, you give an economic value to that, and you now are measuring both the income and the output in terms of uh, uh, money. So I invested 10 pounds, I gained 15 pounds in terms of health. For the reason we stated before, is a, is a, a controversial kind of analysis because it's not fairly straightforward to give a clear economic value to one net increment of the quality of life, that's, that's uh, not easy, it's not impossible. So normally I ask to my student on this slide, uh, how did you arrive here this morning? But now we are in lockdown, this doesn't work. But uh, if anyone has come by car, then I normally ask them if they have an insurance as they normally should. And if you have an insurance, you should know that the, the, the value that the insurance will pay in case you lose a finger or an arm or, or, or even more, uh, this depends from many variables, including your gender, your age, your profession, and many other variables. And that's because below the concept of uh, life insurance or car insurance uh, or whatever kind of insurance, there is the so-called value for life theory behind. So there, is, there are tables which uh, give a value to all the parts of your body. And, uh, and uh, those tables obviously change with age, gender, and the profession you are doing. So people normally, they are skeptical about the cost benefit analysis because they don't like the concept that uh, is behind the, the idea of giving an economic value of, to life. But uh, when you start getting a bit deeper than that, you discover that we all have accepted this concept in our life because we all have an insurance for one reason or another. So sometimes it's just that you don't pay attention to that. But uh, giving a value to your life is something that you have done since you are 18 years old, if you started driving a car, uh, younger if you were driving a motorbike. So that's 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 uh, as, as, as real as it is. It may sound cynical, but uh, not more than your uh, car insurance. But it's, so the real reason why cost-benefit analysis are not really widely used for health technologies because just you don't need that. So the only case in which you need that is when you are the prime minister and you need to uh, negotiate budget between, I don't know, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education or Defense. In which case you need to have a common scale which allows you to compare health with something which is completely different, such as 
uh, defense or education or industry or whatever else. Now, if you want to do that based on evidence, you should eventually convert the value of each program um, in money and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and take a decision based on the net benefit that one program in one minister would be uh, more beneficial than another for the whole nation. But that's clearly fantascientific. I don't know any government which is doing that. And I don't know if I would love to live in a place which is doing that. But my point is, you don't need the cost benefit analysis. You are comparing an health technology with an health technology because whatever is your outcome is into the health domain. And the quality of life should be enough to measure the quality of life. You, you don't need to convert this in money because the conversion would be neutral. So you will just exemplify those factors from above and below. So there is no need to go that far unless you're not reasoning on a wider scale and comparing an healthcare technology with a bond, in which case you may need the cost benefit analysis, but uh, this is not very common. Here is the same slide, just uh, presented in a different way. I can send Nicholas a book chapter that I wrote on this topic where actually you have some more formal reading apart of this lecture. This is an example of quality of life. So for the cost utility, we mentioned it before, we use the 5D scale, which is doing no more than that. So we have five domain, mobility, self-care, independence, pain, and anxiety and depression. And for each one, you measure if a subject is at zero, no problem, I'm perfectly in the mobility, self-care or whatever, some problem and a significant problem. Normally this is a scale that you administer to patient before a treatment, just after the treatment and after a while, according to the specific problem you are doing. Now, if I have a scale which is articulated over five dimension and for each dimension I have three levels, zero, one, true, uh, it means that I have 243 possible states for health, three to the power of fifth, to which normally we add two more states, one being the patient cannot reply and the other being the patient will never be able to reply again is that. And this brings our scale to a resolution of 1 over 245. So we measure the quality of life from 0 to 1 with the step of 1 divided by 245. That's the, the most commonly used general purpose scale that uh, you can find in Europe. There are others daily, there are others, but uh, this is a fairly common one. And uh, those scales can be more or less easily converted from one to another. So there are people spending their life deciding which one is better. Mm, as an engineer, I don't care. Give me a tool, I will use it, and eventually I will convert this unit into that unit as I learned to do. What is the problem of those utility scale? Because you know I'm saying they are good, but so they have also some limit. And this is one of the main ones. If I am saying I have a scale which goes from zero to one with 245 different levels, where uh, I'm now reverting. I'm assuming one is the top and uh, zero is, uh, is that. Uh, I may have a condition which brings me to 0 0.4. So my health is at 40% for a reason or another. Now, what I really want to do is measure over time how long it will last this condition. And uh, it could be that with one technology, I can uh, bring the patient to 100% for 40 years and then the patient will die. Let's imagine this is a terminal therapy for cancer. And there is another technology that uh, will keep uh, the quality of life at 40%, but uh, for 10 years, and then the patient will die. Now, the limit of those scales is that they just you know, calculate the area under this curve. So according to this utility, four years at 100% are exactly the same as 10 years at 40%. And obviously here, there are all sorts of problems from the ethical perspective, from the personal perspective, we may have different choices. I may like to live for 20 years with a condition which brings my health to 20% or someone else may prefer to lie just one year at 100% and that's all. So this open in, in a wide domain of discussion, especially in the ethical domain, but not only there, there are also other domains to be considered. So this is an exemplar of utility uh, a common one, and this is one of the several limits that uh, academics and scholars debate about those kind of scales. There are clearly several algorithms to choose one technology versus the other. So 
If the two consequences are the same, then you just use a cost minimization. If they are different, you ask yourself, is one measure again uh, sufficient? So just pain or just mobility? If it is, then you go for a cost effectiveness. If you need more than one health measure, then you need the cost utility. If you need to compare bomb with the uh, syringe, then you need the cost benefit and a lot of luck. So there are clear algorithms for choosing which kind of technology you may like to use. And uh, as I mentioned before, we normally work in this condition that the cost of your innovation is higher than the benchmark. And you are assuming that the impact, I use the word X to say whatever, effectiveness, utility or benefit. So, but the impact is higher than the one of the benchmark. So we are normally in this domain. And in this domain, what you do, you do an incremental cost, for instance, utility ratio. I will show you the concept with the slide in a few seconds, but uh, with an animation. Otherwise, if the cost of your technology is higher than the benchmark and your effectiveness is lower, then you are in a dominance. And so A is more expensive and less effective, no reason to consider A. Otherwise, your technology is cost effective if your cost is lower and your benefit is higher than the benchmark. So we are down right in the diagram I presented you before. But the majority of cases, of interest end up falling in this domain when you have a higher cost, which is normal for an innovative technology, but also uh, you expect better impact on the quality of life, for instance. In which case, that's what we do. We put on this cost effect diagram, uh, our innovative technologies. In this animation, I assume it be to be the benchmark, one to be the first technology we are analyzing, and then there is a second option. So I'm. Assuming the case in which I have two novel technologies and uh, a benchmark. Now, the novel technology, one is assuming to have 30% um, increase of quality of life compared to the benchmark, and the second is 40%. But the first comes with the cost of 30,000 and the second with the cost of 70,000. And now this means that uh, if I try to compute the cost effectiveness ratio for one and two, this is what I end up. So delta C for one is basically um, 3000 plus than the benchmark divide. Sorry, this is, there is a mistake in this slide. But if you calculate the incremental cost effectiveness of this on the benchmark is 3000 divided, 30% uh, divided by uh, 3,000, while for the second one, it's 40% uh, divided by 7,000. And this obviously results in different cost effectiveness ratio. For this one is 10,000 per unit that you are increasing, or oh, the, the mistake is in the index. So this is one, this is two. So the first one is 10,000 because it's 3,000 divided by 30%. And the second one is 7,000 divided by 40%, which is the net increment of health of technology two over the benchmark. And now, because of that, the second technology is uh, more cost is less cost effective than the first. Both are below the threshold for cost effectiveness that we normally consider suitable in the UK, which is uh, between 20,000 and 30,000 pound per quality. But the problem is that if I adopt one of the two, this may have an impact on the cost effectiveness of the other one. For instance, if I assume the technology number one and I draw the line for the willingness to pay, which is again 20,000 per pound, now probably the second technology compared to the first is not cost effective. Because if you divide uh, 4,000, which is the net incremental cost of the second technology on the first, divided by 10%, which is the net increment of quality of life from the second compared to the first, then you arrive to an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is 4,000 divided by 10%, which is 40,000 pound per unit. And this is above the so-called willingness to pay in the UK. So that's the kind of reasoning we do when we work on uh, economic evaluation. This is a, an exemplification. We are just looking into the math, which is the simple part in, in an L technology assessment. Uh, and in this case, the math would suggest that the technology number one is the winning technology. It's just the trivial math 
that's not the most important part in an health technology assessment or an, an economic evaluation, but this is just to give you an idea of what is the underlying reasoning in terms of cost and utility. And then obviously this has to go into the context. You need to be sure you are engineers, so you should be uh, uh, familiar with the complexity which is behind those numbers and understand if those numbers can be trusted or not. It's clearly uh, not easy. Okay, I would stop here with this slide and just I want to focus as Nicholas suggested on uh, the relevance of health technology assessment for uh, um, medical devices. So we will spend the remaining 10 minutes focusing on the health technology assessment of medical devices and considering the perspective of the IFMB, the International Federation on Medical and Biological Engineering. Uh, just to give you an idea, the IFMB is uh, this one and is the National, the International Federation of Biomedical Engineers. And uh, together with the International Organization of Medical Physics, we are uh, both members of the IUPES, the International Union of uh, Physical and Engineering Societies in Medicine. And uh, what is peculiar of uh, those organizations is that they are not just scientific societies, but they are part of a wider ecosystem, which is in official relation with the uh, United Nations. For instance, uh, IUPES is a member of the ICSU, which is uh, part of uh, UNESCO, while the IFMB is an NGO in official relation with WHO, as well as IOMP. IOMP is also a member of the United Nations Nuclear Power Agency. So those scientific society, they, they gather together scientists and scholars in the remit of uh, biomedical engineering, clinical engineering and medical physics. But most important, they are active member of a wider ecosystem and they serve those ecosystems as civil servants, as we were mentioning at the start of this presentation. Now, the IFMB focuses on, on what we consider to be the main outcome of biomedical engineering, which is medical devices. And uh, why do we think this is an important topic? We think it is important because this is, for instance, the number one in terms of patent application in Europe since many years. Those slides are from 2015, but uh, uh, the latest report from MedTech confirms those data. So even four years later, medical technologies rate still as number one for number of patent application uh, per year in Europe, which means that this is the, the domain which is dominating innovation in Europe by far. And this account for about 40% of the total number in the world of um, patent application. So this trend is not just a European trend. And if we want to get an idea of uh, the impact which medical devices are having today into the medical domain, then normally Nicholas and myself, we use those slides. So if you think about medicine as this was done about 200 years ago in Europe, this is a surgic theater in an hospital, uh, university hospital, uh, UCL in, uh, in uh, London. Um, and then you compare this with the situation nowadays, you clearly see that basically nothing changed. So I have a doctor here and I have a doctor here. I have nurses here and I have three nurses here. And obviously the setting is the only thing which is changing, which is the only thing we do as biomedical engineer. We are not medical doctors. We are not nurses. We are not patient, hopefully. Um, but we are those which design those objects from the lamp to the screen, to the infusion uh, pumps, to the surgic uh, equipment. So those are all objects, robotic surgery. Those are all objects that are the result of innovation driven by biomedical engineering. And people in charge of that in hospitals, clinical engineers, those are those which really look after those technology in every hospital to be sure that medical doctors, they can do their job. So if I compare it from the past and I use uh, and then look at the present. So when we mention uh, medical device, we move from uh, a very simple object uh, like uh, a syringe to very advanced medical devices such as a positive emission tomography or, or even more complicated one and uh, such as active implantable devices. And if I wanna get an idea on the future, not only I have to consider 
the number of patent applications per year, but probably look at the trend over a few years, which means that uh, if I just use those numbers from 2005 to 2015, but the numbers are still going in this direction, it means that uh, drugs are still doing very well, 6,000 per year, but medical devices are doing twice better. So we are above 12,000 over patent application per year, which means 1,000 per month, which means that we we consider, I don't know, 20 days per work per month, then this means about uh, 300 novel patent application per day. And 300 novel patent application per day, if you consider 10 hours working from the very Eastern to the very Western part of Europe, this means about uh, 30 novel patent application per hour. So those are the numbers. So while we are discussing, no, sorry, not 30, but three, Three novel patent applications have been applied during this one hour seminar, three per hour. This is the number. So that's how fast innovation in this domain is growing. So that's one of the reasons why we need to consider health technology assessment, because there is also another important information. And that's the fact that 10 years ago, probably a technology required 10 years to move from a patent to uh, the real market, the real world. And now this time is becoming shorter and shorter. So uh, now a technology, especially into the ICT domain, may have just one year from the registration, doesn't matter if it is a patent or a software, which is just registered, to enter the market. So it's, it's from 10 years to one year. And if you combine those two things together, the numbers which are growing and the time to the market, which is shrinking, that's what Nicholas referred to a tsunami of medical devices going to enter the hospitals in the next few years. And that's the main reason why we need to strengthen our health technology assessment capability. So the IFMB did several projects trying to focus on the differences between medical devices and drug. Why we need that? Because health technology assessment started probably in the 70s focusing on medical device. So it all started from there. But then for the following 20, 30 years, it was mainly focused on drugs. And the reason was that drugs have been the main driver for expense in the NHS all over the world in the past 50 years. Now things are changing because of the numbers I have showed you before. Medical devices are becoming as expensive as drugs is, and it's reasonable to assume that they will become more expensive than drugs uh, for the NHS in a few years. I don't have the numbers exactly now, but this trend is, is a clearly showing that the importance of medical device in healthcare is growing, I don't want to say exponential, but uh, very fast. And so all the methods we have analyzed before for health technology assessment have been driven by drugs. And drugs, by their nature, they are much simple than medical device. There are many reasons, but let me just highlight the fact that, for instance, drug is mainly therapeutical. I don't know any drug which is diagnostic, while a medical device often is diagnostic and doing the assessment of something which is diagnostic, it's fairly more complicated because the impact on health does not depend on the diagnosis itself, but this is just the initial step. And then you, you have to go across several stages, which means also the one which will take your diagnosis and uh, then use it to make other decisions. If a mistake happens there, still the impact of your diagnostic is, uh, is, uh, is not clear. So you need to learn how to assess something which is diagnostic, which was not at all on the table when uh, health technology assessment was developed in the 80s, 90s, or early 20s, focusing mainly on drugs. Now there is a huge discussion on that since more than 10 years or 15 years now. Uh, there are several other differences. For instance, uh, the, 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 um, the manufacturers for drugs, we have mainly large multinationals organizations, while the 85% of medical devices in Europe are mainly produced by small and micro enterprises. And that's the reason why every and each biomedical engineer should know exactly what it is health technology assessment. Because if you are working into the pharma sector, probably you have an entire department in your company which is dealing with health technology assessment. If you're working in a company which is manufacturing medical device, this means that you have no more than four, five, or up to 20 people working on the device. And this means that probably you don't have an expert of a unit which is expert of health technology assessment within your company. Now, probably it means you may 
consult external experts and that's fine, but you need to have an understanding of what you are asking them in order to choose the proper one and understand what they are selling you as a consultancy. So because of this inner difference, it's clear that uh, while uh, those producing drugs, they may have no knowledge of HTA because they will have within the company a water department which is deeply experienced in health, in health technology assessment. For a medical device, it's different. So we need all to be trained on this topic. And there are many other variables. Again, I will share with the, I will ask Nicola to send you one of our papers on that where we discuss in details all those differences. Uh, I will give you just four examples. Intrinsic differences, extrinsic. Oh, let's go on the topic so that it will be more clear. For instance, this is a study that one of my PhD students, now associate professor in Monterrey University, Mexico, Luis, did on uh, wearable devices for falls. And uh, what we came across is that uh, the heterogeneity was something which would have never expected. So we resulted in uh, proving that uh, the position of the sensor, if the sensor was uh, at the lower back, at the shin, or at the upper back, uh, in comparison with the test that uh, the patient was doing, quite standing, seated to stand, there is a water literature, this is an open access paper, you can read all the details. And even the analysis that you were doing on the signal acquired, if it was angular velocity or frequency or linear acceleration, those three things combined together were deeply changing the results of study measuring their effectiveness. So you cannot just say an inertial sensor is effective or not for preventing faults, but you have to say an inertial sensor is more or less effective in preventive faults according to the test you are using, quite standing or sit to stand or whatever else, the position of the sensor, if it is a lower back, shins, upper back or whatever else, and the way you are analyzing this information. Is it angular velocity? Is it a fast Fourier transform? Is it a linear acceleration? What are you doing? Because if you don't consider those three domains together, you are hindering the result of a study in assessing how effective is a technology leveraging of wearable sensors for predicting faults in later life. And that's probably the reason why those technology are not yet into the market because we don't know how to assess them. This was the first study proving how complicated it is to measure the effectiveness of one wearable sensor for a specific problem. So if you open this to any problem you can try to monitor with a wearable sensor with many technology, this is just an inertial sensor, you may have any other sort of sensors. You have just an impression of how articulated it can be. With a drug, this could have never happened because it doesn't matter how you are administering a drug or it, it has a, a, you know, a, an influence, okay, but it's an influence which is very well known. Is it a pill? Is it a syringe? Is it whatever else? But as soon as the molecular, which is the fundamental principle of your drug, is arriving on the target, the effectiveness from there to go on is exactly the same. In this case, we see that even just the way you position the sensor on the patient is affecting uh, the result. Not to take into account the, the, the maintenance and the lifespan of battery and the, all the other things that clinical engineers have to face with any medical device in any hospital every day. So the complexity of the domain is, uh, is really overwhelming and we need to acknowledge that. I don't want to spend too much time, but the paper is uh, online. The other important reflection is that a medical device is dependent from uh, the environment in which it is used. When we think to a medical device, we think to uh, medical engineering, all the structural requirements, the technology which is underlying, so clinical engineering, the organization of an hospital or another. And uh, if you start removing those pillar, then what happens is that whatever you know about the medical device can be actually questioned. So what uh, we did in our studies, we proved that uh, the places where we run health technology assessment are normally much higher in terms of quality and performance than the average hospital, because normally they have better facilities and uh, they are, I don't know, university hospital, which means the mean age of people is lower and probably their attitude to study is different and their organization is probably more flexible than the one you may find in a rural hospital in a, in a corner of, uh, of an island in Greece. And, and because of those reasons, whatever we know coming from an health technology assessment should be questioned because 
the hospitals in which we run a randomized control trial are not representative of the average country hospital in a remote area on the highland in the UK or in a small island in, uh, in southern Italy. So that's another important difference. Now, starting from those reflections, oh, this is another important example. Uh, innovation in medical devices is not, uh, is not disruptive, it's incremental. So if we just focus on uh, active implantable devices, uh, pacemakers in this case, there has been an evolution which has not been, uh, you know, step evolution over time, but rather incremental. So we had the first pacemaker in the 60s and uh, the intracardiac pacemaker from Medtronic in 2016. Now, this study, which I put it in those slides, uh, were considering the incremental innovation given by the fact that uh, this technology is uh, transparent to magnetic resonance or not. And what happened here was that the FDA, for the very first time, admitted into use a novel medical device without requesting an over trial, because the incremental innovation was such that uh, you can still consider the effectiveness proved with the previous one, just add on top of it that now this technology is uh, transparent to the MRI. And because of that, you don't need to run again an over trial. So probably trialing is not the best solution for any medical device. And trials, randomized control trials, are really considered to be the uh, state of the art for gathering evidence in medicine. To conclude, the IFMB did uh, a very interesting study on uh, health technology assessment of medical device. Again, this paper is, uh, is uh, open access, so you can download it and uh, read the details from the paper. But basically, we identified at least five critical points in the assessment of a medical device that uh, should be further analyzed uh, and we need novel methods and tools to assess medical device, which are peculiar and uh, deeply different from the one that we use for drugs. Nicolas, probably I can stop here. Leandro, thank you so much. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. I didn't want to stop you. I think that everybody enjoyed it, but uh, some of the participants probably had some other commitments. Uh, that makes the difference of a talented uh, teacher. I, th I think I, I, I'm so glad that you have been with us today. And next uh, year, I hope to be in uh, a real seminar here in Patras. It's always a pleasure to have you here. I would like to pass the microphone to Aris because there is a question at least. Yes, there is one question for Leandro. So it is. Uh, it is said by Christos Alessandropoulos, so he's, he's asking if, in your opinion, the patient should be involved in the HTA process, and how possible would that be concerning the lack of scientific background of the patient? Now, this is an important uh, question. Thank you for asking. Yes, patients should be involved in, uh, in, uh, in taking decision as a general concern. Uh, but we need to take into account what we just started saying before, that there is an asymmetry of knowledge between patient and medical doctors and uh, engineers. Um, so yes, and they often are involved. So in any hospital, for instance, in the UK, there are uh, structured programs to get uh, um, lay participants, potential patient, uh, to the assessment. And uh, the way this is done is that uh, whoever is applying uh, for a novel technology to be assessed with the NHS is to make an effort to describe in lay words what are the impact and the benefit of your technology for uh, the patient themselves in a language that the patient can understand. So uh, as you do for drugs, when you put into the, the box of the drug instruction, which are meant to be for lay users, uh, the same should be done for a medical device. On top of that, you have the clinicians which they should act as a, as a, a procurer for the patient. So they should be able to, and they know the patient and they know the typical question they get from the patient. So they should be uh, capable to translate those diff difficult or technical contents to uh, patients which may have different than biomedical engineering background. So this is normally what I uh, recommend. Perfect. So uh, if anyone else uh, wants to make a question, you can always press the raise your hand button 
on the lower part of your screen. I would not have another question right now. Okay. Probably we're quite late, uh, so I think that we can close. Yes, we can conclude. Is, um, uh, all this webinar will be able to download it uh, from various sites. Uh, one of them will be the probably in bit and uh, another one probably at uh, clinical engineering division. Oh, Kaliroy, you came up uh, with the video the right time. Thank you so much uh, for organizing this. Uh, it was really a great pleasure. And uh, uh, I think that uh, before uh, closing this session, I have to thank again everybody uh, for the participation in this. I hope you, the, all the participants, enjoy. Uh, of course, so many thanks to Leandro again for taking uh, the time and uh, be with us uh, today with this uh, excellent presentation. Just a reminder. Next Monday, we are going to have a very good uh, webinar, I hope. Uh, it will be the second one in this series and probably the last. But uh, I think uh, Ernesto and Danza will be with us and uh, especially Julie Polisena, who is a real world uh, expert of health technology assessment, will present real world evidence for health technology assessment concerning medical devices. So, Roy, if you want to add something. No, thank you for organizing this amazing webinar. Yeah. They were excellent. And yeah. we'll also post this probably on HTAT and CD websites. Okay. okay. Thank you. Andrew. So, I have just to uh, say congratulations from uh, pro the president of the Hellenic Biomedical Technology Society. And thank you very much, Leandro, from Professor Bamid, uh, Panagiotis Bamidis. Thank you to all. Thank you to Professor Bamidis and thank you, Nicolas, for this invitation. You know how much I like to come back in Padra, so next yeah. year we'll be in person. I know. <laughs> I know. Okay. We will give a, a webinar from Patras this time. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.